So we're here at the CES. So what's going to happen in 2014? I think from from a mobile devices perspective, which is um, where I'm focused, I think 2014 is going to be a, a lot of uh, deepening of capability. And what I mean by that, deepening. So within mobile devices, a lot have been really negative. We've seen a lot of negative uh, comments about 2013 and what transpired or didn't happen, and some would say a lack of innovation. And we're not really necessarily seeing 2013 as a bad year, but there was definitely a lot of research and development spend on new ideas that companies didn't get to see a return on that investment. So 2014 will be a year where you're going to see a lot of those capabilities in mobile devices. Um, let's say things like you know, more, more pixel depth or more capability within cameras and imaging. Things that were perhaps being toyed with or introduced in some models of devices in 2013, you'll see that become uh, more common or take hold in certain models. Like for example, perhaps uh, uh, what's called uh, HDR is going to be the, uh, yeah, HDR video. And, and, yeah, HDR is a technology that it's not going to be right for everybody, but you can certainly find the audiences that are going to be very interested in that, whether they're hobbyist photographers or whether they're professionals, and it's going to be directly applicable to the the, the work that they do. It's also going to get introduce the capabilities that HDR provides to a whole range of uh, audiences, consumers that never would have even attempted it before. So it's, uh, it's something that's going to trickle down and, and be more pervasive to audiences. There's lots of what's called uh, people, sadly perhaps, using their phones as their main camera. Yes. And so it's important to have a good camera technology yeah, it's, in it, thin optics. It's interesting as we've moved from SLRs to more of the digital handhelds, you know, um, more of the just the simpler handheld pocket type cameras to now just back to smartphones and mobile devices. One of the things that uh, an imaging company told me a few years ago, which I think is now holding very, is very evident in the market, is that they spent in the SLR market more than 10 years developing the, the right feel, the right size, the balance, the user interface, you know, where do you, where's the trigger and so forth, so that consumers can take good images. And now with smartphones, all that's been undone again. It's a very unstable platform. It doesn't necessarily give them the tools to do it. When they're touching a screen or pushing a button, it hurts the image, the stabilization and so forth. So there's a lot of opportunity to be able to use uh, processing and digital capabilities to both the onboard processor as well as software to be able to help enhance those capabilities. Do you know the Hero, what's it called Hero, those small uh, sports cameras? GoPro? GoPro. Yes. Is that special or is it just a... I think they were in the right place camera. at the... Well, I don't think it's necessarily a cell phone camera. You're talking about uh, more of a, a hobbyist camera. Um, it's very interesting how athletes, both professionals and amateurs, uh, skiers and bicyclists and even runners have picked up these types of devices to be able to capture what they do. And I think that's a really interesting aspect to it because it's, it's again making it accessible to more people who maybe don't have the inclination to you know, go off of a, a mountaintop that's never been skied before or to jump out of an airplane and capture that experience. But they can live it through someone else who's trying it. And now they're going to need a device that's both uh, flexible, easy to use, and rugged at the same time. And the founder is a billionaire, so it's got to work. There's got to be good profits on this. Well, I think that it shows that they're willing to stick to stick to it and to find a solution that works. And I think that you know this year at CES in 2014, we're, we're definitely seeing wearable cameras taking a, a more front and center role, and whether that be uh, computing vision that's being done through goggles and glasses, or whether it be these standalone or wearable cameras. I think they're they're very interesting, and of course the prices can come continue to decline. They can be used in more and more applications. So the first video we did, are we talking about smart books? Yes. Which kind of was a thing yes. and didn't really happen, yes. kind of. But now there's an arm part Chromebook like dominating Amazon. Yes. And uh, how how much bigger of a share do they going to have in 2014? I'm guessing. I don't know. I'm just saying it every I year. Don't, I don't know that you're necessarily going to see it change dramatically. I don't think that the value proposition is necessarily changing the dynamics of the market. It's but what it's doing is allowing a web-centric computing experience on a large screen with a traditional productivity kind of keyboard and touchpad to be able to impact uh, the computing space where in places where. Uh, having uh, performance uh, 
connectivity or CPU performance, graphics performance may not be the driving need, it may be value, or it may be versatility for applications to be able to pull a lot of different web content. So I think there's a place for Chromebooks and that smart book concept of an ARM-based computing system, and I, I, we still continue to count them like, today. I'm guessing they'll have 50% of the market this year. Do you think so? No, I don't think it'll be that, that significant. Exynos Octa-Core is gonna be fast enough to like, most consumers are gonna be like, this is good enough. And but it's I, gonna be two or nine or less. But I think you have to look at what applications people want to accomplish. And I think the web makes sense, but it's making sense only in the most developed and competitive marketplaces where you have Lots of competition from carriers and service providers. They're offering different pricing and tier structures and data capabilities. But the places that need that affordability most are the places that don't have the connectivity, they don't have the competition, and they don't have an audience then that can afford a solution because there's nothing they're going to do when they're connected. So in the beginning you said 2014 is about, what do you call it? Deep a deepening. Deepening. Deepening of what it. What else is there a deepening? I think a, a lot of the wearables, you know, we touched on cameras, but I think a lot of the wearable opportunity which I would summarize as sensor packages, and driven by the availability of smartphones. You know, if we say that smartphones are now the majority in markets like the US and others, of the mobile handsets that are being deployed, you've now got a tool. And that tool, through sensors, allows for short-range communication to be able to abstract information about what's going on around you. Everything from health and fitness devices, wearable cameras that can capture and stream to your uh, uh, to your mobile device, but then also be able to look at new applications, uh, putting sensors into clothing or just in your environment. And once you've got that capability, then that next step is making it affordable. And I think sport and fitness trackers are a great example of that today. Under $100 US, almost disposable in a way, and they created a huge amount of awareness through the smartphone apps and through web apps to be able to know about how many steps you take in a day, uh, how's your sleep quality, other attributes that you take, you somewhat know a, a little bit about, but in general, there's a lot of awareness that could, could occur. And once you have that information, it's very powerful to the consumer. They can take action upon it. They can use it for security, and so they know if there's a breach in security, they can take an action on it and send the proper response. Uh, if we're talking about health and fitness trackers, if the doc, you know, doctor's been saying you need to lose some weight, get more exercise, now you've got a machine that's telling you the same thing, and you can now actually be able to see that difference and track the progress. And I think arming, arming audiences like consumers with that ability is incredible. Then the next piece is now you're starting to then integrate machine-to-machine -machine capabilities where the environments as you move between them, so this convention center, an airport, your home, your office, the park, all can be able to uh, interact with your mobile device, provide that user interface that uh, allows the human to be able to interact with all the systems around them in a way the human wants to rather than how today maybe an operating system or a, a mobile device manufacturer tells you to do it. So maybe the most interesting new phone in 2013 was Moto X, this amazing sensor stuff. Maybe well, I think, I think in general, yeah, I don't know that I just pick on one vendor necessarily. I think there's a general trend there. Um, but we only saw it really in the higher, kind of the upper class or the hero products uh, in smartphones. And I think that opportunity can be driven down. You know, maybe it starts with just uh, compass, um, you know, tied with navigation as well as accelerometers. But uh, things like proximity can come into play. I think there's a lot more that can be packaged into there. And the combination of that sensor data is what's going to really be impactful. It's awesome, this little uh, speaker, uh, no, the microphone they have listens to you all day. Yes. It's amazing. It's amazing. Obviously, we haven't got to the point where there's enough about there where people are going to have the uh, the cultural types of concerns, the, the regulatory concerns of is this legal and who's listening and how's the data being used. But certainly, once you have audio as a sensor, that microphone is really important as well because it's another tool to be able to help correlate what the other sensors are telling you. So it could be that you're in a high density environment with lots of people, so you're moving very slowly. Audio could be able to tell you about that and how to react to that environment by noise cancellation or uh, picking the right microphone to be able to give you the proper input or applying software algorithms to be able to uh, have a noisy environment such as the one we're in now come across as if we were in a very private environment and be able to communicate very clearly. So I think each of those things we have to look at as a sensor. Uh, I think with the way that people are going to interact with them is primarily as uh, a wearable device. They're going to see it as some sort of a 
uh, either an app accessory, an application accessory, or a smart accessory that they pair with their mobile device to do more than they could when they bought that mobile device to start with. So maybe it's not that much the big level, uh, the 64 bit and the arm that's going to be more important is maybe the sensors. The, sen different the sensors are going to have a lot to do with it. I think what you've seen with Big Little and what you've seen with uh, kind of the emergence of 64 bit, let's say, has to do with optimization, which is doing more with what you have, kind of living within your own means. So Big Little, in a sense, is saying uh, for the particular task, look at each task individually and then be able to separate that out and apply the appropriate processing capabilities, DSPs, and, and so forth to it. So all that has a factor in terms of optimizing the battery, optimizing the user experience to, to get the most out of the device. 64 bits taking that to that next step, which is we can take the next leap in, in using mobile devices, battery powered devices, and get even more processing and more performance out of this device. The question of course is, what are you gonna do with it? And I think that's still open for debate, but it's never been a problem in the past when we look at any other processing market, whether it be PC or servers. It's really never been an issue. You give more capacity, more performance, there's going to be an application to be able to consume We need to have that. more, uh, sorry I extended uh, so much, but we need to have more desktop outputs from small devices where it could be dual boot kind of like either running a bunch of full Ubuntu on Android or full Windows on Windows Phone, you know, like as soon as you have HDMI you should have a full desktop. You should be able to do that and certainly projects like the Ubuntu smartphone and being able to, to dock that device and use a large uh, display, for example, I think is actually a, a very brilliant concept. It's not much unlike what we saw with Motorola and the, Atri the first Atrix product, right? But it was so proprietary and so specific and perhaps not well engineered, but it was very easy to torque it and to break it. But the concept's the right one. If we can agree that processor architectures continue to improve, whether it be based on Moore's Law or the individual architecture platforms and the progress they're in, each making in a competitive environment, pushing each other ahead, that capability is going to translate to having desktop computing in, the, in your hand or in your pocket. And so being able to then have that be your primary computing device that has your credentials, that knows your services and what your preferences are, allows you to be able to walk between your home, let's say your, your your computing at home, your home entertainment, you're at work, you know, as you walk into your desk or into a conference room, or when you interact with services around you, like going to your bank. Why can't that mobile device act as that tool to enable all of those new functionality? I really do believe we have the capability to do there. 2014, the end all year to see that? No, it's of course a year of progress but I think we're seeing the first steps of that happen. I can hope that Android 5, that Google is putting this one feature in there. Like uh, supporting, let's say, uh, the, the external Chrome displays OS on sure. Android. And there's a number of ways to support those external displays, but I think that's, that's really a, a key driver, is being able to separate these components that we think of as tied together that you always have a screen every place that you have computing and processing. And I think you can start to separate those as building blocks and be able to say, we have communications technologies and protocols that are gonna be able to scale, whether it be the distance or whether it be the capacity for the application, that's gonna allow that mobile device to be your personal uh, portal into all these different displays, whether it be home entertainment, whether it be at the office, or even walking into your vehicle.